They have been some charging for special services, uh, non-emergency special services, people locked out of their premises, uh, some animal rescues, uh, maybe people that are uh, stuck in lifts, not trapped in a lift. So if it's a, a non-emergency special services, uh, across the country some authorities have considered charging and indeed some have levy charges. And for other services, uh, I know in East Sussex ourselves we had a major chemical spill um, at a particular premises after we dealt with the initial emergency. The clean-up operation was one that lasted for four days and we went on site for four days and assisted the company in cleaning up and charged for that and the company were quite happy to pay. So now services do charge for some of the services that they do provide. It's in the immediate emergency that services in the main don't charge. And I know speaking to my own fire authority, some local politicians are reluctant to levy a charge because they have a view that the public and indeed uh, businesses pay through their council tax or business rates for the fire rescue service and therefore they have already paid. I think in this harder economic climate, services will be looking much more closely at that. So um, do you think there needs to be a set guideline as to what constitutes a charge and a chargeable occurrence and what uh, isn't a chargeable call out? Well, I think firstly we have to ensure that we conform to the law. Fire Rescue Services Act in the May um, talks about fire authorities' roles and responsibilities and their statutory duties. Uh, but outside of that, it's very much uh, a local issue for local authorities to determine, with their local politicians and the public they serve, whether or not they want to charge for particular services or which ones there are. There are there's already broad guidance um, on services that, service, that fire rescue services could charge for if they chose, but it's very much for local determination. I guess the key is sort of risk management and not wanting to put, as uh, I think the point was raised, disencouraging people from wanting to call the brigade out to an incident if they thought there was a they could do something before getting charged. Well, I know through my own career that I've been out to certainly chimney fires, and that after we've put the fire out, the householder has said, "How much do I owe you for that?" Mm. And uh, clearly, we don't charge for that type of service. But in some parts of the community, I do believe some people think that they may charge. I think there's also an issue that we need to understand as society changes and we have a much more diverse community. Um, there might be people living in the UK that have come from other countries where they may have paid for their fire rescue service. So we just need to understand that. I'm not sure that we fully understand all of that. Uh, but what we would want people to do is, if they need us, uh, not to be intimidated uh, or frightened of calling us out because they think they might have to pay for the service. Uh, the fire rescue service is there to, uh, to rescue people, to help people, to save lives. And that's our primary function. I think we need just some careful consideration about that, that if it was seen that the fire rescue service charged for services, we need to be clear on which ones we may or may not charge for so that we don't um, cause any concern in the public's mind that they might not then call us out when actually they should call us out immediately. Um, in a recent leader we had, um, Andrew looked at the fact that there are certain areas that don't overlap that well and raised East and West Sussex as a, as a prime example. Do you agree that there's, um, there needs to be a, a split of services in that area and if so, why? The, the matter for you know, services and combinations is very much a matter for you know, the local authorities and local communities. I can only speak on my own experience in East Sussex. Uh, my own authority, and indeed myself as a Chief Officer, believe that uh, there is a strong argument for combination with West Sussex. Uh, and in fact we had a business case which West Sussex Fire Authority and their Chief Officer fully supported. And we had a business case that went out to local communities with overwhelming uh, support from local communities and business leaders for a combination. But there are many factors to take into account in terms of a final combination which include things such as council tax equalisation and government grant to that new authority. Uh, and there are barriers. The barriers are overcomable, but not in every instance. So whilst we had a very robust business case for an East and West Sussex merger, which personally and professionally I, I believe would be the right thing to do, partly because it would give us the same boundary as the police force, which is the Sussex Police Force, and I believe there are opportunities for closer working with, the, with Sussex Police if we were a Sussex Fire Rescue Service. But there are some barriers, particularly the one of council tax equalisation, uh, that do need to be sorted out. And I believe that central government can assist that process. So do you think that's another key area of potential integration is closer working with other emergency services? Well, across the country, I would 
suggests that all fire rescue services work very closely with their partner Blue Light Services, particularly the police and the emergency ambulance service. So I can't comment in any great detail on how it works everywhere, but I know in my own experience we work very closely with Sussex Police, the South East Coast Ambulance Service and indeed with West Sussex Fire Rescue Service. So there's lots of collaboration already going on. But the question we need to ask is could you deliver more efficiencies and a more cost effective service through integrating even more? And that's a question I believe we're all exploring and looking at. Uh, in, in my uh, career in the fire and rescue service, I've seen the skills of firefighters uh, develop over that time. So their operational skills have developed as we've had new equipment and new techniques. But equally, their first aid and trauma care skills have developed. And in some services, there are very highly qualified um, emergency responders from a, a health side in fire and rescue services today not quite the paramedic that you would see on the ambulance service. And I think we also have to recognise how the ambulance service have developed their skills. So 30 years ago, the ambulance service skills were, were much different than they are today. Uh, paramedics are highly qualified uh, medical practitioners. So I think there is both an overlap but a complement, complementary approach to the service. I see fire rescue services doing more in terms of uh, co-responding and first responding in some parts of the country but this is this has to be done in consultation and agreement with the, the local ambulance service there are only I believe 10 or 11 ambulance trusts in the country now so most of them cover an area quite much larger than fire and rescue services and this is a case of the fire and rescue service discussing opportunities with the ambulance service about how they can uh, support their service delivery and it's different in different parts of the country but again, across the country, you'll see fire rescue services being more involved in, in support uh, and complementary work with their emergency ambulance services.